He abused me every night. It was unbearable for me, but I was young. I didn't realize what was really going on. He was treated like a king in Gabon, Africa. Father Patrick Roche, one of the longest serving priests of the Society of St. Pius X, a traditionalist priestly group that broke from Rome in 1988. But instead of bringing the light of Christ to the African continent, Grosch brought darkness, turning the mission into a predator's playground with the help of multiple SSPX clergy. For the first time, victims are speaking out. J'ai pu voir ces villages de païens devenir chrétiens et se transformer, non seulement, je dirais, spirituellement et surnaturellement, mais se transformer physiquement, socialement, économiquement, politiquement. In the 1930s, a young father, Marcel Lefebvre, from France, became a missionary priest in a small African country of Gabon off the coast of the South Atlantic Ocean. Working as a seminary professor and later rector for the Holy Ghost Fathers in Libreville, he would spend a total of 13 years bringing the faith to the Gabonese. His work in Africa so impressed the church, Pope Pius XII appointed him apostolic delegate to French Africa, calling him, quote, the most effective and the best qualified of my apostolic delegates. It was thus Lefebvre gained his lifelong love for the African people, and many decades later would not forget where it all began in Gabon. In 1985, after 40 years away, he returned to Libreville, where he was warmly welcomed back by all those who had remembered him. By his side, Father Patrick Grosch, one of his earliest students, ordained for the SSPX in 1976. Grosch was the one chosen by Lefebvre to found the society's Gabonese mission. On January 16, 1986, on the feast of St. Marcel I, Pope and Martyr, our small mission of St. Pius X was born in Libreville. Since then, the SSPX has branched out to 25 missions on the African continent, including in Nigeria, Ghana, Benin, Zimbabwe, Kenya, and others. Once a French colony, Gabon gained independence in 1960, but still retains French as its official language. With a population of 2.5 million, 42% are Catholic. A slightly smaller percentage consists of other Christian denominations, with about 10% being Muslims. Libreville, its capital and largest city, contains about a third of the population. From 1986 to 2008, nearly a quarter of a century, Grosch reigned as superior of the Libreville mission. To this day, the 74-year-old cleric remains a revered chapter member of the SSPX, looked on with respect and devotion because of his close and long-time association with Archbishop Lefebvre and his exalted status as one of the founding fathers of the African missions. What SSPX leadership won't tell you, Grosch, is a sexual predator. And they've known about it for years. Around 2010, an assistant to then Superior General Bishop Bernard Fillet, quote, confided to a priest that they didn't know what to do with Grosch and that he had to relearn his priesthood after a life of shame. This comes directly from an SSPX priest with knowledge who confirmed the facts with Church Militant, 
and who left the society precisely because of its mishandling and cover-up of abuse. Et puis, ben, en 76, il y avait plus de prêtres. In spite of all this, the SSPX featured Grosch in its 40th anniversary video on the founding of the District of France. I was sexually abused by Father Patrick Grosch, a close collaborator of Archbishop Lefebvre and founder of the St. Pius X mission in Gabon. The events occurred in Gabon in Libreville, but also in France in his family home in Baison Sun and also in a society school. That's François, one of Grosch's many abuse victims. François was only 16 in 1986 when the abuse began, the same year Grosch founded the mission. I lay on top of him, my back to him as he wanted, and he started touching my private parts. He caressed me all over and masturbated me. The abuse took place multiple times over the course of five years with Grosch making up excuses for why François needed to come to his room after mass or catechism lessons. In Africa, a white priest was at that time considered an envoy of God. Our parents also respected him greatly because he was the superior of the mission of Libreville and very close to Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. It is for these reasons that I could not react. Grosch had excellent relations with local authorities and was given special treatment, trading off the honored reputation of Archbishop Lefebvre, the government even issuing a special stamp with a photo of Lefebvre on the 10th anniversary of the SSPX mission. 10,000 were printed, quadruple the usual number. With the backing of the church and the government, Grosch was untouchable. Victims were terrified of going against him, and parents revered him as practically divine. Grosch was successful in fundraising for the African mission, raking in donations he's accused of using on himself, building a spacious home in Libreville, renting luxury cars when he traveled, and living and eating well. Fellow clergy also say he adopted a colonialist mindset, looking down on locals and even making racist remarks about them. The abuse continued even after Francois left Africa to study in France, one time when Grosch visited his mother in Besançon. During a two-day visit, Francois was made to sleep in the same room as the priest. He abused me every night. He abused me every time he came back to visit us in France in the boys' boarding house, Star of the Morning Academy, in Egglesheart, France. He was the superior of the mission of St. Pius X, very authoritarian, very strict, the right arm of Archbishop Lefebvre. We were very afraid of him. In 1993, when Grosch visited François studying in Sargemine, France, he finally worked up the courage to tell the priest no. After that, François never saw him again. Decades passed. Now an adult, François recognized Grosch had never been held accountable for his crimes. He finally reported him to the SSPX. I sent a letter to Father Davide Paul Urani the Superior General of the SSPX, in December 2019. He received a response on January 17th from Secretary General Father Christian Touvenot from the French translation. The Superior General recently became aware of your letter and the serious accusations it contains against a member of our congregation. Touvenot traveled to visit François, where he took down his testimony. And on May 19th, Actually, I spent, uh, most of my time. Father Paul Urani held a virtual meeting with Grosch, where the priest immediately admitted to the abuse. The translated letter notes, As soon as the superior general brings up, without going into details, the misconduct alleged against Father Grosch, he speaks up, admitting his guilt, clearly and without difficulty.
Grosh, who has prostate cancer, told Pagliarani he was sorry for his misconduct and that this moral sorrow is much more profound than the problems of physical health he's currently suffering. On May 23rd, Pagliarani set forth restrictions on Father Grosh. Among them, he cannot receive visitors privately. He cannot offer catechism lessons or spiritual direction. He cannot leave the priory without the permission of the superior. He can go on vacation at a time and place permitted by his superior. On December 1st each year, he will report to the district superior. He's still, however, allowed to offer mass and help with Sunday liturgies. Inexplicably, while he's banned from offering private spiritual direction, he is allowed to hear confessions, where he can be private and alone with another. Pagliarani alerted the local prosecutor to the allegations, but the SSPX has never issued any public statements about Grosch, instead quietly transferring him to the SSPX house in Lourdes, France, the Maison Saint-Ignace, where he remains to this day, just minutes from the world-famous sanctuary, a place of pilgrimage for scores of families with children. François believes the SSPX only reported the case to the prosecutor because it was forced to, after Grosch freely admitted to the abuse. I am certain they would never have done so if the facts had not been corroborated. Because the statute of limitations had passed, the prosecutor was unable to charge Father Grosch for his crimes against children. Francois also doubts his movements are being strictly supervised. As Church Militant has extensively covered, the SSPX has a history of lax oversight and even lying about predator priests' restrictions. In 2012, on the 25th anniversary of the founding of the Gabon Mission, the SSPX published a flattering piece on Father Grosch, reminiscing about his time in Libreville. The SSPX asked him, among other things, why he made the unusual choice to stay in Gabon for so long, rather than branching out to other African missions. He said, We stayed on the mission because initially there was a large influx of faithful, and at the same time a large number of children in catechism. It is obvious that if we want to properly train the faithful and children in catechism, to prepare them well to receive the sacraments, baptism, communion, confirmation. We must give them lessons regularly, at least twice a week. As already mentioned, it was often after catechism lessons that Grosch would abuse Francois. But Francois wasn't the only victim, and Father Grosch wasn't the only abuser. I was a victim of Father Patrick Grosch and Father Damien Carlyle. Father Damien Carlyle was a fellow priest in Gabon from 1991 to 2000. Born in Sydney, Australia in 1965, he was ordained for the SSPX in 1991. He was sent immediately to Africa. It was Damien who started the sexual touching on me around 1992 or 1993. It started when we went to the beach, first very discreetly, giving me my towel and helping me to wipe myself. He took the opportunity to touch my private parts. Jacques arrived at the mission in 1989. The abuse began several years later. Damien wanted me to get naked and touch my private parts. It gave him pleasure and allowed him to ejaculate. Carlisle organized beach trips, taking boys for what was supposed to be a day of fun at the shore, and then molesting them. It was unbearable for me, but I was young. I didn't realize what was really going on. Grosch also took part in the abuse back at the mission. As with Francois and others, he would ask Jacques to come upstairs to his room alone. I arrived. He asked me to wait. He went to the bathroom and he came back naked. He asked me to masturbate him. According to Jacques, 
Both Grosch and Carlisle had a well-established system, taking sexual advantage of altar boys after high masses, including Christmas and Easter, also making them bring collection money back to their rooms, abusing them, and then paying them a few silver coins in exchange for their silence. Sometimes they would ask the boys to stay overnight. Our parents were not suspicious. They trusted the priests. Everyone called us the darling children of priests. The priests were aware of each other's abuse, and it even became a competition between them. One day I heard Father Grosch say to Damien, to each his darlings, to each his favorites. Father Carlisle would arrange overnight trips to the small village of Meba, about an hour east of Libreville, where Jacques says he also abused boys. I know at least six other victims, but they don't want to talk. I know that many of us have been abused. Grosch and Carlisle began to grow jealous of each other with the boys they abused, and eventually had a falling out. But during the period they preyed upon children, they didn't work alone. They had help. Early on, the SSPX sent fathers Carl Stalin and Loïc Duverger to become assistant priests in Gabon. All three clerics had bedrooms upstairs in the mission house. Not only did they assist Grosch in catechizing children, according to Francois, they were accomplices in his abuse. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I remember perfectly the first time when the priest who assisted Patrick Grosch asked me to join him upstairs in Grosch's bedroom. It was Father Carl Stalin. Stalin was in Gabon from 1986 to 1995, nearly 10 years. Today he serves as District Superior in Eastern Europe, after a stint as District Superior in Asia. In Gabon, he brought boys up to Grosch's bedroom, alone, and left them there, alone. Father Carl Stalin and Loïc Duverger asked the children to go to Grosch's room. Father Loïc Duverger also helped. In Gabon from 1986 to 1989, Duverger later served as district superior for Africa. He is brother to accused sexual predator Father Pierre Duverger, whom Church Militant has reported on extensively. He would ask the girls to call him Daddy, at times signing off by saying, Daddy loves you. Father Pierre remains in active ministry, overseeing children at an SSPX academy near Orlando, Florida. His brother Loïc currently serves as assistant to the district superior in France. It was Stalin and Duverger who came to get me to go to Patrick Grosch's room. Both Stalin and Louis offered testimony during the investigation into Grosch's abuse in 2020. Neither one admitted knowledge of the abuse, nor, of course, did they admit they facilitated the abuse. But it wasn't just Grosch, Carlisle, Stalin, or Duverger. Other clergy also allegedly preyed on Gabonese boys. Named among testimony given during Grosch's investigation was another priest, Florentino Panacotl from Mexico. He oversaw the sacristy and led the Eucharistic crusade for boys. Serving in Gabon in the 1990s, his alleged attraction for boys was known, with locals calling him a pervert. <laughs> In 2000, two victims came forward to report Father Carlisle. The Superior General at the time, Bishop Bernard Fallet, did what he's known for doing, transferring the predator to a new assignment. It's what Fallet did with Father Philippe Peignot, found guilty by a canonical trial of abusing multiple boys, including famed French paraplegic Vincent Lambert, who made international news in the late 2000s for his family's fight to keep him alive. It's what Fillet did with Father Frederick Abbe, currently sitting in a Swiss prison serving time for abusing boys, arrested only weeks after Church Militant reported the convicted pedophile had been roaming free in Switzerland, only minutes from Econ, 
home to the SSPX seminary. It's what Filet did with convicted rapist Father Christophe Guanel, found guilty of torturing and raping female teachers at an SSPX academy in France, and whom Filet squirreled away temporarily at a monastery in Beaujolais with the hopes of restoring him to ministry. But police found him first and arrested him. It's what Filet did with Father Pierre Duverger, accused of sexually grooming a 12-year-old girl he was counseling, also accused of raping a vulnerable young woman he was also counseling. Filet transferred him from Bordeaux to a monastery in New Mexico, then reinstated and promoted him. And it's what Filet did with Father Damien Carlyle, with tragic consequences. You now have managed to shatter my trust and hope in you. My Lord, I am no one of consequence in this world, but I had thought that a bishop of God would be trustworthy. After a few months in the SSPX seminary in Flavigny, France, Filet transferred Carlisle in 2001 to Wanganui, New Zealand, to St. Anthony's Priory, where he lived for about two years, granted free movement and free access to children. Even visiting the island nation of Fiji in 2002, where he can be seen surrounded by boys and girls. It was around 2001 that he began abusing Eric, an 11-year-old, along with Eric's young friend, Tom. I understand the sinner needs mercy and compassion. And yet, where is the mercy and compassion for the innocent? Their minds are shattered, their bodies are betrayed, their hearts broken, and their souls, ah, their souls, something happens to their very souls, something I've never come up with a word for, but it is why even old men weep when thinking about it 60, 70, 80 years later. There were also claims Carlisle abused Maori boys, New Zealand's indigenous people, some who attended the SSPX chapel in Wanganui. Tom told his parents about the abuse, and they reported it to the SSPX. It's unclear what, if any, actions were taken by Bishop Filet at the time. It appears he waited several months before exiling Carlisle to St. Joseph House in Quassade, France, in 2003, run by an SSPX affiliate, and which doubled as a dumping ground for problem priests. Carlisle stayed there until 2009. After the forced exile, Filet restored him to priestly ministry in Johannesburg, South Africa, where he was allowed to move freely until 2011, when Tom's mother informed Eric's mother, who had not known until then, about the abuse. Eric's mother then reported the abuse to an SSPX priest. And now you will come to the bishop. Around 2012, while on an Australasian visit for confirmations, Bishop Filet personally met with Eric's mother, admitting right away he believed Carlyle had abused her son. He never informed her of Carlyle's lengthy track record of abuse. Neither did he reveal he was the one who assigned Carlyle to New Zealand, placing her son and other boys directly in harm's way. For 15 years, our boys have suffered, and still, the authorities are doing more for the sinner. Our boys will carry these damages all their lives. There is no escape. There is no way out. It is always there. In spite of Filet's promises, he would never allow Carlisle back to New Zealand or Australia, even for funerals. In 2017, Eric's mother learned the predator had been back, not once, but twice for two funerals, there on extended stays, Filet never even having the courtesy to inform the family. Filet has broken promises to victims' families before. When you met with Bishop Filet, yes. he also gave no indication at all Not that he knew of Father Abe's past allegations. At the country, 
the opposite. Totally the opposite. Totally the opposite. Filet willfully concealed evidence from the court and from the parents of sexual assault victims. And he said, oh, I, I can't because it's a secret. It's a secret and uh, on, only, only Rome, only Rome can, decide. can decide if I can give you a secret. And he said, and he said that, that at that time, he already knew that Rome had decided that the FSPX should resolve these cases internally. So he knew that. So, so you're he saying said, that, did you, are you saying he lied to you? Yes, of course he of lied. Course. With no, he, he, he's a good liar. Once the mother of Father Carlisle's abuse victim in New Zealand realized Bishop Fillet had lied to her, she wrote him a scathing letter. You obviously deem it paramount to communicate with a pedophile who abused our children with homosexual acts rather than communicate with our tormented children. Oh, how this smacks of the way the Vatican has treated the sexually abused for many, many, many decades. You, I see, have decided to duplicate their example and throw our boys on the junk pile. My Lord, you have allowed great concessions and much for Father Carlisle. What have you done for our boys? Boys you told me you absolutely believe were sexually abused by that priest because there is too much evidence that it cannot be denied. Nothing. You have done nothing. You have learnt nothing. If you had learnt anything at all by now, it should have been that your abandonment of our boys isn't just another abuse. It is worse than the original abuse. Today, Father Carlisle lives in a retreat house nestled in the French Alps, in Montgardin. Known as the Golden Prison, it's a place where the SSPX sends troubled clergy. In spite of his decades of abuse, the SSPX has never reported him to police. Neither has it ever issued a public statement about Carlisle, leaving followers in the dark just as it's done with Father Grosch and so many other predator priests. Church militant contacted Fathers Grosch and Carlisle, but received no response. Neither did we get responses from Fathers Stalin or Louis Duverger. The current Superior General, Father Paul Urani, and the previous one, Bishop Fillet, also did not respond to queries. The SSPX continues to fundraise for the Gabon mission, while keeping entirely quiet about the sex abuse that turned the mission into a predator's playground, devastating numerous young souls. Meanwhile, Bishop Fillet, destroyer of innocent children's lives, lives in comfortable retirement in the $40 million SSPX seminary in Dillwyn, Virginia. He has never publicly apologized for his role in facilitating the abuse and has never owned up to his responsibility in deceiving multiple families. Christine Niles, Church Militant, Detroit.